There's a lot of information that's out there on what you should do if you're looking to put your home on the market. There's also a lot of things you need to consider if you're looking to buy a home. It's The Real Estate Show. holidays and best wishes for the new year. This is The Real Estate Show. My name is Rick Naples and I am the broker owner of Zone Realty LLC. You zone your home. We're in the late part of 2017 at this filming. We're just before the holidays or possibly into the new year already and we're going to be approaching the spring season. Now most of you know out there that the spring season is one of the bigger selling seasons to put your home on the market. I mean, there's the old saying, people don't like to move in the cold. Well, spring seems to be when a lot of houses start to come on the market for sale. So if you're looking to do that, what are some of the things you should be looking at in preparing your home for the market? Now, let me step back just one minute and mention to you that the spring season, as defined, is not when spring comes. We realtors start looking at the spring season as early as February of the next year. So if you're looking to put your home on the market, you want to get started early. You don't want to wait until April because at that particular point in time, there's going to be a lot of other competition out there. So if you're looking to put your home on the market, you want to go just before and even before the snow melts. Now, as I said, what are some of the things that you should consider? Well, the main thing is who to work with. What realtor are you going to hire to help you get your home sold? Now, there's a lot of articles out there on how to review realtors, their knowledge, who knows what, who's most familiar with the marketplace, and all those different things that are out there. And some of those articles even say you should interview one or two or three different realtors before you make your choice of who you're going to go with. Quite honestly, statistically, usually when people meet with a realtor, that's the realtor they're going to go with, the first choice. Um, it's all part of personality. This is a very relationship business. You want to meet with someone who understands what your goals and your needs are going to be and is going to work with you to help you accomplish what you want to accomplish, whether that is buying a home or getting your home sold. Now let's talk about home preparation. You've decided you're going to sell your house. What do you do? What's the very first thing that you need to do? Well, I call it the personal walkthrough. This is where you take the opportunity to walk through your home and try to look at it with fresh eyes. Now, that's usually hard to do if you've been living in the home for quite a while because you're used to all your stuff. You're used to that nick on the wall or the way furniture is placed in a room or maybe there's a stain someplace that's just been there for years that you've gotten used to. Perhaps have a friend come over or a relative, or whoever happens to be available, have them come over the house and role play with you. Let them pretend that they're a potential buyer for your home. What do they see? And ask them to be honest. In fact, ask them to be brutally honest. What do they see? What do they smell? How does the house feel to them? What suggestions would they have if it was their house and they were looking to put it up for sale? Now, the reason why I say to have a friend or a relative come in and do this is because of the comfort level. You know, when you put your home on the market, folks, you're going to have a lot of buyers coming through your house, and there's going to be a lot of constant feedback. Your realtor is going to be sending you notes on what buyers are saying about your house. So it's kind of nice if you get a good opinion from a friend or a relative, and you take that in stride. Because some of those comments... I'll be honest with you, some buyers are pretty cruel with the things they'll say about houses uh, that you kind of don't expect. 
And then, of course, there's a lot of positive different things. But have that relative or friend walk through the house and make notes as far as what they see or suggestions of what they want to do. There are three things that you want to look at at first when you're looking to put your house on the market. The first one being what we call curb appeal. Now, curb appeal is how the house presents itself to the neighborhood, to the street. Now, if we still have snow on the ground, it's going to look different than when the snow has melted. I've said many times on the real estate show that you want to approach your house from different directions of the street and take a look at how it looks as you're approaching the home. I mean, does the house look cluttered in the front yard? Are the garbage cans out in view to the street and it's not garbage day? Do you have too many cars in the driveway? Does the front door entrance going to the house look presentable and welcoming? Or is it cluttered with old decorations or dead plants? Is the stairwell that goes to the house in good condition? All those kinds of things you want to take a look at. You also want to make sure that the number on the house is visible from the street. I have some fun sometimes with sellers and I say to them, go stand out in the middle of the road when there's no cars coming, obviously, and look at your house. Can you see the number? Is the number prominent to be able to read? You have to remember, realtors are going to be looking for your house to show buyers, and buyers are going to see your house on the internet, and they're going to drive by to check it out. They want to confirm it's the right house. There may not be a realtor sign in front of the house. You know, some sellers nowadays don't want to sign in front of their house. And also, too, if we're still in the dead of winter, the ground freezes, so those sign installers have an issue with trying to put that post in the ground when the ground is frozen like a stone. So sometimes there might be a, not a sign out there. Or your house has come on the market, the realtor's starting the marketing of it, and it's going to be a couple of days before the sign's installed. You want to make sure people can find the house. So take a look and make sure the numbers are prominent. And if they're not, make the effort to change the numbers. Get bigger numbers to stick on the side of the house or a lighted number pad or something along those lines. It's also just good to do even if you're not putting your house on the market. You want to make sure that emergency services can find the right house if they need to find it. And also the postman knows the right house when they're delivering the mail. The second thing of my three things is the cluttering. Now we talk about this all the time. You need to go through your house and make sure that it has a flow. What I mean by that is you can walk through the house without bumping into things or having to dodge around things. If you have big oversized furniture, you might want to consider taking one or two of those big pieces of furniture out of the room and putting them in storage so that the room looks more open. Look at the kitchen. The kitchen is probably one of the most cluttered areas besides the kids' bedroom uh, that you're going to find in the house. I mean, you have counter space, but you've got all kinds of small appliances on the counter, um, displays on the counter, things you use when you're cooking, and so on and so forth. You know, the toaster oven, the toaster, the microwave, the coffee pot, and so on and so forth. You want to clear that stuff off. You want a buyer to be able to come in and look at your kitchen and see the counter space that's available. So I always recommend that you minimize or you clear your countertops off so that they're open and they look spacious. They're not cluttered with a lot of stuff. And again, I always point to the refrigerator. A lot of us put memos, notices, kids pictures, magnets we've collected, whatever, on the refrigerator. And that's fine. But when you put your house on the market, you want to clear all that stuff off because you don't want to draw attention to the stuff. You're drawing attention to looking at the kitchen. So declutter, declutter, declutter. It goes for the same in every single room. And along with the decluttering is the third thing, and that's depersonalization. It's hard to take family mementos, pictures, and things like that off the walls and put them away. We've got them there because we want to see them. We're proud of them. But when a buyer or stranger is coming into the house, you really don't need to advertise your personal life to them. 
So you want to put away those pictures. You're going to have to pack them away anyways when the house gets sold. So depersonalize the house. Now a lot of us have hobbies. A lot of us like to collect. Those are other things that you want to make sure you put away. Because again, when a buyer comes in to your house, you want them to look at the house, not your stuff. If you've got a lot of stuff laying around, collections, um, lots of memorabilia, lots of family pictures, uh, there's clutter everywhere, that's going to distract from looking at the room or looking at the house. And it's going to cause the buyer not to be able to imprint. And what I mean by imprint, imagine themselves owning that house and their stuff being in the house because your stuff is in the way. Let's take a look at this presentation on some tips of what to do when you're looking to prepare your home to put it on the market. And I'll be right back to talk about some of them. That presentation brings up some really interesting things. And one of the things that I like about that is it talks about repainting. There's lots of advice on the internet as far as painting is concerned. Now, if you're looking to make a house look clean and fresh, fresh paint is the easiest way to do it. It lightens everything up. It makes everything look clean. Maybe changing the color scheme a little bit. Uh, we talked a lot about neutralizing or using base colors when it comes to painting a home um, to make rooms look bigger or smaller or lighter and so on and so forth. So again, a lot of research you can do on the internet, a lot of suggestions. You talk to the realtor when they're there and you're interviewing them and you do your walkthrough of what they might suggest. You want to also make sure that you look behind things. I can't tell you how many times I've sold a house and during the final walkthrough, that's when the house is completely empty, you're getting ready to go to the closing, you're going to the house that you're going to want to buy and you're going to do the final walkthrough. All the furniture, all the pictures, everything is removed from the house and now the buyer comes in and what do they see? They see the outline of the couch on the wall. They see outlines of pictures on the wall. They see a hole that was behind a bureau. They see scuff marks that someone just pushed something in front of. That can be very depressing to the buyer. In fact, I've had buyers go to the closing and want to renegotiate the sale of the home because they've seen damage that they didn't see otherwise when they walked through it in the first place. So look behind things. 
See if it's clean, if it's presentable. And again, of course, if you repaint, that's the best thing that you can do. Another idea in prepping your home for sale is to fix things. I went into a house one time a few years back, and we were going through the kitchen cabinets, and my seller's looking at the, you know, the cabinets and wanted to see what kind of storage space was in there. She reached up, she grabbed one of the pool handles on the cabinet to open it up, and the handle came off in her hand. Well, obviously, we made a joke about it, but I mean, it's little things like that that distract from the attractiveness of the home. You got to remember, buyers are going through your home and they're making a mental list. If I buy this home, what are the things I'm going to need to do? Am I going to need to repair this, fix this, replace that? Am I going to need to paint? Am I going to need to you know, widen this? Whatever. They're making these lists and that's all part of their process when they're looking at potentially making an offer. So let's not give them a reason to make low ball offers on your home. Let's go through and see what things need to be attended to. That's very important when you're looking at things that you know are at the end of their life. You're selling a home and you have a 30 year old furnace. Well, unless you can provide good service records on that furnace and a testament that it's in good working order, buyers going to look at that and think, geez, they're going to need to replace that furnace. That's going to be a big expense. Same thing with windows. I know we live with all the flaws and the pimples and the blemishes of our homes. We tend to put off things. But if you have a window and it has cracked glass, please replace the glass. You'll be happy you did. It's something that the buyer is going to find. And if a buyer misses it, the home inspector definitely is going to find it. Statistically, when you go to make an offer on a house, um, it's about 98% of the asking price. And that's usually because they're asking XYZ amount of dollars for the house. You're making an offer. There might be a credit that's going back towards closing costs, whatever it might be. So it's not that you're offering less than what's being asked most of the time. It could be because there's other considerations that are in there, especially after a home inspection when you might want to negotiate on those items you want the seller uh, to repair or replace before you close. But it ends up somewhere around 98%. You want to make sure you use the guidance of your realtor and the guidance of the information that's out there so you're not overpaying for a house and you're comfortable with the price that you offer, you have a good chance of the seller accepting that offer, and once you move in, you're comfortable with making the mortgage payments on whatever you purchase the house for. Let's take a look at this quick little presentation and I'll be back with what I call the real estate mailbag.
This is the portion of the real estate show I call the real estate mailbag. My opportunity to address questions that you see that are emailed to us here at the real estate show. Now usually I'll answer an email or I'll just make a general commentary about something that has to do with real estate. Today's show it's a commentary as opposed to an email. As I said, we're towards the end of the year. We're heading into the new year. New years bring renewal, a lot of excitement, a lot of looking forward to the future. And if this next year is going to be the year that you're going to be purchasing a home, make sure you're prepared in all the right ways as far as putting your home on the market or as far as being prepared to purchase a home. Nothing is more frustrating then if you put your home on the market and you get all the way through to accepting an offer and then things fall apart because of something you did not prepare for or frustrating on the other side when you go to buy a home and the same kind of thing happens. You can't get the mortgage or an unforeseen problem comes out and it doesn't allow you to get to closing. So do the best that you can. Follow the guidance of your realtor. Follow the guidance of the other people that are involved in helping you purchase that home or sell a home and get to a successful handover of the keys, closing of the deal, and moving into and living into your new home. My name is Rick Naples. This has been The Real Estate Show. I thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.